Hello London, welcome to LDN ONT TV. This is not a rerun. Brona couldn't be with us tonight, so I am filling in as your host. I'm Deputy Mayor Sean Lewis, and you may remember uh, I used to host this show a few years back, and it's a real pleasure to fill in for Brona this evening because we've got two great guests with us. So I'd like to, right off the top, introduce these two gentlemen. The first is Eric Brunt, and Eric is a Canadian filmmaker. Uh, and he's working on a project for the Canadian War Museum that we're going to talk about tonight. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. And our other guest is Canadian Forces veteran uh, and the recent uh, recipient of the Legion of Honor Medal from the Government of France, uh, Sir George Beardshaw. Welcome, George. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, I want to jump right into uh, our conversation tonight because it's an important one, uh, and, and it's about the capturing the stories of Canadian veterans, uh, those who served in World War II and in other conflicts around the world. Uh, <clears throat> George, you are a Canadian Forces veteran, but your story actually starts before your service because you came to Canada uh, as a home child. Yes. Uh, so. Tell us a little bit about uh, that experience. You were a, a boy living in an orphanage in England and you chose to come to Canada. Yes. Well, I chose to come to Canada because my oldest brother came here in 1934. And, uh, and when, when you get to be 14 years old, you left school over there in England and you, they, they usually try to find you a job. And uh, I was coming. I uh, 14 years old, and one day the uh, school inspector came around and, and he said, uh, how many of you boys would like to go to Canada? So I put up my hand and uh, that was that, you know. And I came over to join my oldest brother who came here in 30, 1934. Now when you came, you weren't placed uh, in the same home as your brother though, right? You you were placed on a farm with a different family? Oh yes, uh, when we finally uh, got to Canada here, we, we came on a boat, uh, Empress of Australia in 1938, and that was the boat that brought the King and Queen on, on their 39 visit, 1939 visit to Canada, the same boat. And I, but years ago, the, the children used to come over on empty cattle boats. You know, the, you know, so it wasn't much of a glorious adventure then, really, oh, it was it? It was. Yeah, my, the, my, my, well, my, when I come over on this, this, this nice, beautiful liner, it was great. Us kids were right in that glory, living like people that had money and all that kind of stuff, like, you know, yeah. I was seasick, of course. Of course. <laughs> Uh, then, uh, so you learned right there that the Navy wasn't in your future. Pardon? <laughs> you learned right then that the Navy wasn't in your future. No. Well, I, <laughs> yeah. But uh, let me see. Uh, see, see. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, yeah, when we arrived in Canada, uh, it was nice and warm, you know. And I think it was late. August or something, and it was harvest time, you know. Uh, and so they put you right to work on a farm. And, but anyway, we got to uh, Jarvis Street. That was the headquarters of this uh, of the Dr. Bernard's homes there, and they had a list of farmers there. there about a hundred farmers on this page, and they only had fourteen boys and two girls. So, so they said. Go over there, look at the list, and choose one of these farmers you'd like to go to. Like the, so, I looked down the list, and uh, there was uh, Mr. and Mrs. Payne R R one. I didn't know what R R one meant, but uh, he said Little Britain. So me being kind of smart, I said, Well, I came from Great Britain. I'll go to Little Britain, and that's where they sent me. Yeah, because uh, my reception. When I got to the farm, was, of course the farmer was kind of mad because he had to drive to the station and pick me up when he could be riding his binder, cutting the grass, I cut the grain, you know. So, so anyway, when I got there, it was about half an hour before noon, the meal, 
And uh, the farmer's wife looked at me and she said, is that grease you got on your hair? I'm having none of that around here. She said, I don't wash it. Uh, pull the slips and all that kind of stuff. She said, do you know how to mow the lawn? Well, of course I do. At that time, the lawn mowers all were made in Britain, you know, and we knew how to push one of them little things. But this thing that they had, it needed repairs, and every time you pushed it, 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 it didn't always work. So at a heck of a time to cut the grass. Anyway, it was noon time, and they had another hired man there, but he only came by the day once in a while like that. And so we sat down to eat our meal and, and caught on the cob. Well, I watched the hired man pick up a cob and put some butter on there and a little salt, you know. Um, so I copied him. I think I ate three cobs. And the farmer's wife said, that's enough, that's enough for you. You, you, you're going to be sick, you know. So anyway, that was a good start on the first day, you know. And I understand you, you spent three years on the farm, uh, spent, uh, and at 17, yeah, uh, you uh, walked away. What's that? And at 17, you walked away and went Not to find 17. your brother. No, no, I was older than that. I was 19. Okay, yeah, yeah. and you went to find I your brother I don't here. remember all them dates, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, well, I, I was down in the barn milking the cows, and we each had three cows to milk. He had three, and I had three. And I'd already finished milking my three cows, and uh, so I was starting to milk one of his. And when he got down there, I said, well, you know, this cow isn't giving as much milk as, he, as, he, as she used to. And he said, Keep your mouth shut, she'll probably give a little more. I thought, oh God, you know, talk to me like that, like uh, that gave me an opportunity. So uh, he said, well, what are you gonna do? I said, I'm gonna join the Air Force. He says, well, I don't think you'd join the Air Force because you're too yellow. Oh, oh, oh. So I got up off the milking stool and threw the pail over with the, uh, the cats there waiting for their share of some milk. Threw the pail over there, and I, he says, where are you going? I said, I'm, I'm gone. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. Yeah. yeah. So went up to the house. The old lady was making breakfast. George, you're up early. You got the chores done already? I said, all I'm going to do. I said, I'm leaving you. And she started to cry. She said, after all we've done for you, they never did for me, you know. So anyway. I got my clothes, changed my clothes, and went walking down the road. And I said, you can send my trunk where I'm going. I think I'll go to my brother's place down near Tilsonburg there. And so that's how I left the farm. I stayed there with my brother for a couple of three months there. And then I went to Toronto. And I tried to join the Air Force, and they said, I didn't have enough education, and you'd only be a grease monkey now anyway. So I transferred to the Army at uh, the Horse Palace in, uh, at, the, at the fairgrounds in Toronto. Yeah. That's how I joined the Army. Like, you know. And from then on, my life was different. The best move I ever made. Yes. Well, and we're going to pick up on where that took you uh, after our break, but we do have to go to a quick break, and we're going to, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, uh, your return to uh, Britain as a member of the, the forces, and, oh, and yes. we'll talk about Eric's okay. project there. So yeah, boy. stay okay. tuned for uh, yeah. more of LDN ONT TV right after this. This program is brought to you by the following sponsors. Carbon monoxide is a deadly gas you can't see, smell, or taste. Homes with fuel burning appliances and or attached garages must have working CO alarms installed outside all sleeping areas. Don't let the silent killer get you. Install working CO alarms today.
night's action on Rogers TV. Heartbeat of Mother Earth, I feel you and embrace your warmth. I see you dancing through the trees. Your song floats on the summer breeze. Community, we come together. We are the voice of our ancestors. Thankful for how much you bless us. Feel the thunder in the drum. All our voices sing as one. Feel the power, feel the pride. Feel the drum beat deep inside. Feel the boom, feel the bass. Let's let go of time and space. It'll make you dance, it'll make you sing. Oday Wei Gun, Wedok Wishin. The drum will lead you, take you far. Always remember who you are. You're watching Rogers TV. And we are back with more LDN ONT TV and our guest tonight, Canadian filmmaker Eric Brunt and Canadian Forces veteran George Beardshaw. And we were talking to George about uh, his arrival in Canada as a home child and then his, his leaving the farm and rejoining the Canadian Forces. Uh, and now we're into World War II, George, and yeah. they're sending you back to, to Britain. Well, and I and you'd found out that you had family that you didn't know about. Yeah, well, I had... Uh, Yes, uh, on my last leave before going over to, well, I, let me see, I was training in, in Camp Borden. I was, it was my turn for uh, put lay the breakfast tables in the, in, for my, the, the guys in my hut in Camp Borden there. And uh, they were playing the 10 top tunes, and they, uh, they said, bullet, bullet and bulletin, the Allies have landed. And I, it's D-Day, like, you know. Uh, I'm sure the hair on the back of my neck must have stood straight out, yeah. So anyway, uh, I went on my last leave to my brother's place down to the Tilsenberg, and, and uh, on my way back to, uh, to camp, uh, Camp Borden, I was going down the steps into Union Station, and I knocked this guy. He was coming up, and I was going down, and I knocked this guy off his feet, and he looked up to me, looked up at, looked at me, and said, George, well, I'll be done. It was a guy I knew at school in England, and he came out after me, and I think he came on the last ship of, of home children, like, you know, yeah. yeah. And then I went overseas, and uh, they said, uh, I wasn't on their D-Day, so. Uh, uh, so you arrived overseas. after D-Day, and, yeah. and you were deployed, was it in France first, or was it in no, Holland? I went to, we landed in Scotland, and we went down into Yorkshire, and uh, my brother Charlie, who was in the British Navy, still in England, uh, he g gave me my mother's address. I don't, I don't remember nothing about my mother because I was put in the home when I was three years old in a place called Baby's Castle. And then when you got be five years old, they put you in a, another home where, oh, where the older children were. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I had the address, and and uh, they were going to hustle us guys over to France because D-Day was over, and the Queen's Own Rifles had lost a lot of men on D-Day, and they needed reinforcements right away, you know. So I told the Colonel, I said, oh, the Colonel says, no, we get to the leave, nothing, we got to get you right over right away because we need you. and. I said, well, I have a mother who lives not too far from here. I have her address. I didn't even know my mother because I don't, didn't remember her like that. So he gave me three days leave, and uh, I went and saw my mother, 
can you imagine a, 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 a 21 year old guy a son that she'd never seen since he was three turning up on her doorstep you know um, and on the eve of heading off yeah. uh, to be deployed in the yeah. war yeah Pardon? and on the t at, the, at the time when you're heading off to be deployed in the war so it's a very brief reunion yeah. right so he got three days leave yeah and uh, my grandmother was there I remember and she was a little old lady ever she had about six inches of knees there, and she grabbed a hold of me by my belt, sat me on her knees, and and like those old ladies years ago, you know, some had hair sticking out here, and there, and she rubbed her face against me. I never forget that, like you know, yeah. So Eric, you've been uh, working on uh, capturing the stories of our veterans. Veterans, um, yeah. What okay. got you started in? Yeah on that yeah. project yeah. well I I met I, I met George back in 2018 when that's when I started doing interviews across Canada and what started me on my project is my grandfather was a World War II veteran and he was a little bit older than George he was born in 1918 and he passed away in uh, 2013 so I was in university when he passed and I realized that when he passed away I had none of his stories he didn't really talk about the war uh, he was in the Air Force, and it made me wonder what other people were out there, other veterans, and uh, not just Air Force, but Army and Navy as well. And it became sort of a mission of mine to try and interview as many as I could. And, and George is one of, how many have you interviewed now? Yeah, so I've interviewed 470 World War II veterans now, but George is a bit special because uh, he's the only Queen's Own Rifles veteran I I interviewed along the way so out of all those interviews he's the only one I found from that quite well-known regiment that uh, fought their way through France uh, Belgium Holland and then eventually Germany and, and I, I can certainly relate to that uh, you know I, I'm a member of the Victory Legion branch here in London uh, my own grandfather was a, a prisoner of war in World War II so like you George uh, he, he fought and was a prisoner of war there um, but I never got to hear his stories. Uh, he passed when I was wow. quite young. Uh, and I know that many veterans are reluctant to tell their stories, but it's so important that we don't forget them. Yes. So the, the project that you're working on for the Canadian War Museum, um, are, are, what are the stories like that you're, like we're hearing from George, just even getting to the front uh, was a, a, a huge journey for him. Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of stories are you hearing from our veterans? Yeah, so I, I hear a wide variety of stories. I, I hear from the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, and uh, yeah, George is uh, an interesting veteran because not only was he in the infantry, but he was also a prisoner of war. And I do, I do hear from a few different prisoners of war, but everyone has a different experience. I think everyone has a bit of a different outlook, which makes my job really interesting because I get to hear some of the funny stories, especially from George. Uh, some of the there's some romantic stories, and there's some sad stories as well. And it's trying to it's basically trying to collect uh, as many stories as I can. And with the Canadian War Museum and a company called Melky Films, we're going to make all these interviews available to the public, free of charge, and they're going to be able to watch these stories. And I think it's really important for our children or the youth to uh, hear these stories because uh, not everyone has the opportunity or honor to get to meet someone like George. And I'm very thankful to, to be able to do that and to make these videos available to the public. They'll maybe in a way get to meet a veteran and hear some of their stories. And I hope through some of the humor, um, they'll be able to connect with some of these veterans that are going to be probably 80 years older than them and for future generations uh, people they'll never get to meet so that's the big goal and, and George what has it meant for you to be able to share your story uh, with somebody like Eric and know that it's going to be saved for generations to come oh I, I never really thought about that like you know I, yeah I, everything's happening to me so fast yeah lately yeah I think it really speaks to, to the value of uh, the stories that we're hearing from you tonight, George, that mm -hmm. um, while it seems very busy to you, it's, it's really important uh, to preserve those so that uh, my generation and Eric's generation and others can share that. So we're going to go right to break, and we will be back to finish up this episode of LDN ONT-TV right after this. Okay.
This program is brought to you by the following sponsors. Yo. Yep. Okay, I'll be there. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Mario Elia, and I'm the host of a new show here on Rogers TV that we're calling Keeping London Healthy with Dr. Mario. So tune in Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. and we'll see you then. I'm Jennifer Slay, the host of What's Up London. Join me each week as I meet Londoners who are doing extraordinary things and helping to make the city a better place to live. Watch What's Up London, Mondays, only on Rogers TV. You're watching Rogers TV. And we are back to finish up this episode of LDN T TV with George Beardshaw and Eric Brunt. George, we were talking before the break about, uh, you know, you went to serve in France. You were eventually uh, captured and became a prisoner of war in the last month of the war yeah. in Holland. Yeah. I, I don't think people have a real sense. What was that experience like? Oh, that experience was, uh, oh, uh, I, I, Yes, uh, uh, this was at night time we were captured on a, on a dike road and there was a bridge there that had been uh, blown up like, you know, the big chunks of water in the, river, in the small river there. And uh, we were supposed to get that far and somebody else, another, another branch of the army was going through on the other side of the dike. and. Uh, when we got there, I, I thought there were our guys on the other side of the dike, and they weren't, they were Germans. And whatever happened to the ones on the other side, the, our guys on the other side, I don't know. But anyway, it was a little bit of a schmozzle there. And, and I, I, this schmozzle, yeah. Uh, I saw the Germans. There was a shell hole right on the side there, outside this house, and three of our boys jumped in there, and uh, I saw the Germans shoot the one guy, and and I I was I had fortunately I had time to run into this house that was right there, and I could see out the window there, and uh, and then there's two other guys and they were wounded. And then uh, next thing I know, the Germans came in the back door of this house, and uh, and we we had to capitulate, of course, you know, take our weapons off and throw our weapons away, and the we had to go across this bridge, and they went into this town of Deventer, and uh, of course the. German officers asked us uh, questions. Uh, what was your method of attack and all that kind of stuff? They asked me. They also asked us. We had a brand new sergeant with us. There'd never been an action before. They asked him first uh, a few questions, and I guess they didn't get much out of him because he didn't know too much about it anyway. And so they said, "Where's the corporal? We'd like to speak to the corporal." You know. So they took me upstairs in this house in in Devon to there, and they asked me a few questions, but you're not supposed to say anything, just your name, rank, and number. Yeah. So anyway, they, they said, well, the war's over for you. You'll be able to read books and have a good time for the rest of the war. You, you set the war out. Yeah, sure. Uh, and so you, you spent the last month of the war uh, in, yeah, in might, a prison of war, yeah. a makeshift prisoner of war camp. Yeah, yeah well, they had uh, some, suddenly some couple of old buses that uh, looked like nervous wrecks drove up, and they took us uh, 
uh, to a place called Osbier. Osbier is the flower capital of the world. And they take the bunch of nuns out of the, out of the convent there. Uh, of course, the nuns took all their property out of there, and they yeah. put about four or five guys in each one of the nuns' rooms. And uh, there was a lot more other rooms in that where the nuns yeah, were. Yeah, they just crammed you in like sardines, yeah. eh? Yeah. Anyway, uh, we slept on the floor, dirty old clothes, you know. And you ate well, potatoes. And you ate potatoes. I had two potatoes About a day. Two potatoes a day. Yeah. Which, of course, they gave us a big mixing bowl. Yeah. We thought, well, that, that, that could hold quite a bit of food. Yeah. But we only got two potatoes a day. Yeah. Well, uh, whoever got to the door first got the <laughs> Got the potatoes. <laughs> got the, the biggest ones. <laughs> so, Eric, when. Because George's story has a lot more to share, and I know you've yeah, captured sure. that as well as other veterans. Yeah. So, d for the viewers tonight and, and those who will be watching uh, online later, yeah. when can they see uh, the stories that you've captured through the War Museum? Yeah, so as you can tell, George has a lot more stories to tell, and uh, we, but the interview I did with him, I think, is a little over two hours long, and that's going to be available through the Canadian War Museum. It's going to be called the Eric Brown Collection and it's going to be 470 interviews plus, including George's. You're going to be able to watch that online, and that's going to be launched in, at some point in 2024. That'll be launched. And, and will there be a, a display at the Canadian War Museum that, in its Ottawa uh, location as well? I think there might be some temporary exhibits. I think that bit, that's a bit to, to be determined, but for sure there's going to be this digital platform uh, where you can watch all the stories of the veterans I've interviewed. Well. I think, the, first of all, the project that you're undertaking, Eric, is absolutely wonderful. Thank you, George and Eric, both for being our guests tonight and sharing a little bit of what you're working on a and for sharing your story, George. I think it's so important that we all take a moment to listen to the stories of our veterans while we still have the opportunity. As the grandson of a veteran, as a Legion member myself, you know, I'm always mindful every time I step in city council chambers that I get to do the job I do because of the work that guys like George did to protect our freedoms and our democracy. So I think that's a great place to leave it tonight. And thank you everyone for watching. Rona will be back next week with another episode of LDN ONT TV. Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. With clubs, leagues, and courts in every province and territory across Canada, Squash is the sport for wall-to-wall -wall fun, fitness, and friendship. From coast to coast to coast. Learn to play and you'll want to do it every day. Squash, play inside the box. My daughter is seven years old and has a frenemy. They have play dates that always end up in a fight or tears. This friend bosses her around and treats her poorly, but she still wants to be her friend. What's a parent to do? I would let them acquiesce to a certain amount. And then, you know, when they're at this age, you still need to be supervising their play dates. So I might step in, not to correct the bossy child, but it's my child that I'm concerned about. I would just expose her to other people, teach her to have a voice.